How's it going? This is Six String. Starlight Ironhoof. Four String. And Zeta Prime. And this is Elements of Harmony. Tonight on the show, we interview one of the biggest up-and-coming artists in the fandom, having landed four tracks on the Everfree Radio Top 100 for 2013, including the number one spot. You could say that this artist is taking the airwaves by storm. Not just a musician, but a 3D animator as well. The multi-talented Slipstorm joins us here tonight. Okay, so this week we are introducing... Um, an amazing breakout artist from the Brony fandom, somebody who has risen from just joining YouTube and has risen to 3,000 subscribers in only one year and has landed three tracks on the Everfree Top 100 of 2013 this year. Um, we are very honored and humbled to introduce this breakout artist, Slifstorm. Hi, that's me. How are you doing today? I'm doing fantastic. How are you? Good. Welcome to the show. Thank you. It is lovely to be here. So right off the cuff, I'll just ask, who are you and where did you come from? I love the phrasing of that question. Not gonna lie, that was that was phrased very well. Um, my name is Travis. I'm Sliff or Sliff Storm. Uh, I honestly just I'm one of those people who just kind of makes stuff. I have really no real direction for how I go about it or how I do it which often causes a lot of my projects to go downhill, unfortunately. But um, I just make music because it's fun, and I make animation because it's fun, and I'm an artist because it it's a good stress reliever, and I just enjoy doing it. Cool. Your name is Slifstorm. Where does Slifstorm come from? Um, Slif is actually um, a variation of the word sylph, which is like a, some sort of like mythological um, like air elemental from some point in history. I don't know where it is. It's some cool mythological thing, and therefore no other questions should be asked. But I didn't know that it was spelled Sylph, and so for many years I spelled it Sliff, and by the time I figured out my error, I was too lazy to fix it. So I just sort of went with it, and then I just added Storm on the end because it sounds cool. Fair enough, fair enough. So what got you into doing pony music? And um, I noticed that your, your YouTube was created at the beginning of 2013, correct? Mm-hmm, yeah. What brought you into the fandom? What what sort of uh, got you started with ponies and, and doing music? I, I got into the whole pony thing because I had I, I was one of those people who knew about the whole pony thing, but I was just kind of indifferent on the matter. Like I don't really want to be a part of this, but it doesn't really bug me because I had a lot of friends who were bronies and they would exchange pony things and Skype and whatnot, and they would all go over my head, and I would just kind of ignore them. But over time, I started learning stuff about the whole pony thing without actually being um, a brony. And uh, at one point, I remember a friend of mine was sending somebody else fandom musicians songs. And I think it was uh, it was one of Odyssey's, actually. I remember it being um, Call of the Sea Ponies. It was Odyssey's remix of Call of the Sea Ponies. And I just clicked on it because I'm one of those people who clicks on everything in a Skype chat, uh, regardless of what it is. And that's made for some actually very bad experiences. I should probably stop doing that. <laughs> um, but Rule yeah, 34 and stuff like that? Uh, yeah, more yeah, stuff we yeah. shouldn't talk about on Everfree? I don't want to talk about it anymore. It was bad experiences. <laughs> yeah, but anyways. Um, so yeah, it was, it was Odyssey's Call of the Sea Ponies. I had no idea what was going on, but I was like, this is really good. And so I, I started like interrogating my friends about this, like what the heck's going on. So they explained the whole musicians thing. I was like, okay. So after that, I went on about a seven-hour binge of listening to fandom music and i was like okay i I gotta figure out what's going on here so i sat down and i watched the first episode on youtube 16 hours passed and i got done with the first season and i realized that it was morning and i had stuff to do and i had no regrets about that whatsoever 
Um, as for getting into mu- as, uh, music, I had never actually recorded music or like composed music before this, but I, uh, I accidentally stumbled onto the Toastbeard competitions, which uh, I know a lot of famous musicians have done, mm-hmm. and I just decided to try my hand at it. So I, I made some terrible little thing for the first one, and I thought that it was really fun. So I, I just kept at it and eventually got better, and it just expanded into what it is now, which is still a big mess like it was at the beginning, but it's a slightly more professionally done mess than it was before. So so how long would you say you have been doing your music? It's almost a full year now, I think. Yeah, yeah, about a full year, maybe two weeks off. Now, you said you hadn't actually um, uh, composed music before that point. What was going through your mind that actually said, hey, I can sit down and do this? Um, because I realized that most of the people in the fan base who were recording music were like they were amateurs like not we don't have too many actual professional musicians in the fan base like i know we have quite a few but overall most of them are just you know amateurs who are making music for the fun of making music and a lot of people make music for free and they just do it for fun i was like this could be this could be really fun and i've always wanted to try it so why the heck not what you know what's the worst that could go wrong so i I just i went and got a demo fl studio and i sat down and tried it and it was really fun so i kept at it one of the things that you mentioned, too, was professional musicians in the fandom, and I feel that we should at least take a moment to kind of expand on that in a way. For you, what would you say that a, that a professional musician would be? Like somebody that actually, before the fandom, was making money off of music or, you know, performing? Um, hmm. Now that you mention it, it's a really fun, it's, it's a really blurry line, actually. Uh, I would say, like... Um, I know the Living Tombstone professionally produces because he was uh, he was producing music before that. And he's done music for things like um, Tom Skazay's ASDF series. Um, Odyssey was doing music professionally, but like I said, it's it's hard to tell. So I don't want to call anyone out saying that anybody's professional or unprofessional, right? But it's like a lot a lot of people do this just for fun and they don't make a living off of it. Mm-hmm. You know, they just they just make music because it's a good stress reliever because it's something they enjoy. So if if I had to restate restate that. Uh, I would say that uh, you know a lot of people just do it for fun and not to make a living. Yeah, well, one of the interesting things about it too is that through the pony fandom, a lot of artists have been able to actually go from taking something that's for fun and just sort of sort of start to move into actually making some money off of it, either through donations or through you know stuff like Bandcamp and stuff like that, mm. um, which has been great. Like it, it was the same thing for me. Um, I didn't make any money off of my music until the fandom. And I mean, I still provide everything that I make for free. And I also provide it on Bandcamp if people want to buy it. And there's a lot of people out there that will actually just buy your stuff because they want to support you as an artist. Yeah, I've I've had that happen, actually, because I used to put all my stuff up on like SoundCloud and Dropbox and stuff because I was like, yeah, there's no way anybody's going to buy this. This And then uh, I had a couple of people say, hey, where can I buy your music? And I'm like, what? You want to pay me for this crap? So I was like, okay, I'll I'll put it on Bandcamp and see what happens. And people started paying me for it. And it was it was crazy. So, like like you, I, I always offer my stuff for free because I don't know. I almost feel kind of bad charging for it because it's like I don't know. I always love when music's offered for free, especially if it's if it's good music. And a lot of people in the fan base do offer really really good music for free. So my stuff's always free, but it's I always put a Bandcamp link and people pay me and it's it's incredible i never expected that to actually happen so it's it's been a really interesting experience uh i want to jump back a few steps um you said that you hadn't recorded prior to the uh fandom and stuff like that or prior to like just a little while ago yeah uh do you have any uh traditional musical background like uh maybe high school band or orchestra or something like that um i did band in middle school both both middle school and high school um i was uh percussion and drum major respectively so i've i've played music for a long time i just haven't recorded or you know composed or produced anything um i've played piano for like a billion years i honestly can't remember it's some like 15 years or something ridiculous like that so um i would say i've been doing music a long time i just haven't been making music a long time if that makes sense drum majors are cool i had a bunch of friends who were drum majors yeah, drum major was frustrating because uh, I went to a very new high school. Uh, we were the first graduating class, so the first year of band, we only had two percussionists. So we had to like play stuff with our feet. It was awesome. 
<laughs> <laughs> and and as we kept going, I realized that my uh, our our conductor was an idiot, unfortunately. And it was he wasn't like one of those idiots who's just a blatant idiot. Like he really tried really hard. He was just really stupid, and I tried not to hate him for it. But I just uh everything he did annoyed me. So, are you ready to go on air to the public saying those statements? <laughs> is your drum conductor going to be listening? Uh, if he is, then he will probably not take any offense to it because he's an idiot. But um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, all right then. I, you heard it here, folks. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It's like he's he's one of those people who thinks that the way he thinks is the absolutely correct way to think and if you think anything else then you're wrong and he would actually tell people that like you you know you need to think again until you're thinking in the right way and i wanted to just go slap him in his stupid face but i get in trouble if i do that i <laughs> shouldn't be doing that but you know it's, oh, it's frustrating so eventually i just got stuck up with it and i go and went and played drums by myself which wasn't nearly as fun actually so well, you know, percussion is a dangerous instrument. I mean, a, a drumstick could slip every now and then and just go <laughs> flying across the room. You never know. <laughs> Those were actually the highlights of my band practice. A drumstick could slip. Oh. 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 This is why you're not a host. <laughs> I see what you did yeah, there. <laughs> why are you here? Get off air. Can I just say how perfect that was? That we were all like, oh. oh. That, was, that, was, that was very nice. That was a very nice oh moment. I liked that. That was <laughs> You're welcome. We'll just cut and paste it for later when we're not. You know. Someone <laughs> needs to remix it. Yeah. That is um, actually um, one of the things that I noticed with a lot of your stuff is that you do enjoy um, remixing other people's songs or just doing covers of other people's songs. Um, what is it about other people's music that draws you to want to create your own versions of those of those tracks? I guess, I guess remixes and covers could kind of be considered the same thing for me since... Uh, I, I redo the instrumental as well. I don't really use other people's instrumentals or other people's vocals. Mm -hmm. I guess it's just because um, typically I think that other people musically have a lot better ideas than I do. And sometimes I just like stuck in a horrible musician writer's block or something. And I just need something to do. Mm -hmm. But if I try to work on something myself, I'm just going to end up frustrating myself into like a coma, which I don't want to do because that causes problems for things. But it's like musically, other people's music is is fun to to sort of reimagine, I guess, because uh, it, it takes someone else's idea and sort of puts your own little spin on it. But you you want to change it enough so that you're not blatantly copying it, which is one of the problems I have with a lot of covers. Because typically, when you hear the word cover, you know you think of somebody just you know taking an instrumental and just singing over it, which is fine. But it's not, I don't know, it's it's not nearly as creative as I'd like yeah. to be. I know EQD tends to um, differentiate those by calling them vocal covers. Yeah, I've, I've seen that a couple of times. And I mean, like I said, they're fine. They're, they're fun to do. And I don't know, I just like to get a little bit more in-depth with covering something. So mm -hmm. I, guess, I guess that would be why. Is there anything in particular that actually draws you to a song, though? Like, is there any particular quality where you're like, hmm, the, I, I like this. I want to do something like this. Typically what draws me to music, like people ask me if I have a favorite band all the time and what i have to tell them is that i don't have a favorite band i have favorite songs from bands it's not so much that i like you know some some bands i really like but it's like you know oftentimes i'll have one song that i really like from this person and another song that i really like from this person and i don't exactly know what draws it you know and what draws me to it it's just you know some songs i just really like and that's why i'm not really particular to any sort of genre of music it's like every genre has really good stuff and really bad stuff and it's like, you just have to sort of kind of sort through things to find what's mm. really good. Because, you know, like, dubstep is one that I, 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 I hear a lot of flack about. And it's like, I've heard really, really good dubstep. I've heard really bad dubstep as well. And it's the same thing with, like, you know, orchestral music. I've heard really, really good orchestral, and I've heard really terrible orchestral. I think what mostly draws me to a, to a song is complexity and, uh, like, story. And um, a lot of people question me about that. They're like, you know, well, what if it's a song without vocals? You know, how can it have a story? Like, you don't need vocals to tell a story for a song. But it's like, you know, something that creates a scene in your head is something that I really like. Because right now, um, one of the things I'm trying to work on right now is uh, I'm actually covering uh, Tombstone's Octavia's Overture. Because 
I really love that song because it, it's it's got a really good story behind it, and the instrumental is fantastic too, and it's just one of my favorite songs from Tombstone. But it's got a really cool story, and I don't know, I just want to do it. But one of the challenges that I'm doing is I'm rewriting all of the lyrics. Not that they were bad. It's just I don't know. I want I've I've never done that before, and I want to try and tell the same story with different words. Hmm. So uh, that's that's become quite a challenge for me. But uh, yeah, I don't know. I'd say if I had to sum it up, I'd say that story draws me to music. You mentioned Octavia's Overture. You're currently working on um, one of the things. Like it's a, it's a very interesting instrumental, and like the song does have a good story. But when you actually look at the the music that goes into it, like I did um, a quick cover of it, I think for like some sort of toast beard thing. And one of the things that I noticed was that like aside from the actual melodies with the 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 sort of the little string things that that are in there, it's a really simple mm-hmm. kind of beat. Mm-hmm. And like I'd completely produced the cover and I thought it sounded good and everything and I released it and then a week later I listened to it and I was like I used the exact same drum beat all the way through without ever changing it. Yeah, but I've never noticed like when I was doing it. I do that sometimes too. I don't even know how that happens. I don't know cuz I think I think one of the problems with uh music a lot of days is that People seem to overthink the drums. They think that everything has to have drums all the time, always. Mm-hmm. And the, and so they, they kind of cram them in. And it's like, you don't have to have drums in a song. And that's one of the reasons why I love orchestral music so much, is because it, it, it really works on piecing things together that need to be there. And then it just gets rid of everything else. Like it, There's nothing there that's wasted. I, f- I feel that sometimes people... You know, they put drums into a song, and then they're just kind of there for the purpose of being there. Can I just point out that it's amazing that a percussionist is saying this? As, as a drummer, I disagree. Well, well, I, well as <laughs> as a <laughs> as a guitarist, I I agree one hundred percent. Well, it's like when you yeah, when I you've um, when you've played percussion, you realize how little each individual percussionist does in a band. Like, because you know, when you're a percussionist in a band, each percussionist has one instrument typically like one or two instruments that they play over the course of the song and you know for a lot of time like crash cymbals you sit there (laughs) for 95 percent of the song on your butt and you do nothing but you have to be there for that one note otherwise it sounds wrong so you have you have one small moment of glory and if you drop something or you mess it up it's gone all it's gone all wrong all of it's horribly wrong but you know, one of the one of the one of the most important things about music is that I don't know who said this. Somebody famous at some point said this is like rests are more important than notes in percussion. That's that's really true because percussion is the most the the loudest part of a band oftentimes, and therefore you have to know when to be quiet. It's similar to that uh, quotation about writing or um, speaking, rather public speaking, where the silences speak louder than the words. Yeah, and it's like um, another comparison that I that I heard once that I really like is like people often forget that music is a language. You know, you you speak music just like you speak a language. You write music just like you write a language, and you read music just like you read a language. And people don't treat it that way. And you know, it's it's often music is often mistreated as as a as a term of communication or a form of communication. Mm-hmm. Wow, that just got really like deep philosophical there. Wow. Yeah, yeah really deep. I know. Insert Keanu Reeves face. <laughs> I would also like to clarify, uh, when I said that drummers were useless, I lied. Yes, yes, you did. Drummers are actually if you can have a like uh in a traditional band, meaning like singer, guitar, bass, drummer, all that stuff, if you can have a drummer next to you who you can trust and who you who know is gonna do a good job, he is invaluable. Bass players no. Yeah, the bass player. You don't, you don't bass, need bass player, player is basically <laughs> you get your friend or your sister to come and play bass for you, and then like they learn, and that's yeah. how that goes. For, no, all, no, you, no, for no. all you bass players out we're gonna there, get, we're gonna get Cyril yeah, go to listen to this, right, guys? <laughs> Hold on, I need to defend the bass player quickly because I played trumpets <laughs> and I sing a lot, so I'm on melody all the time. And one thing with melody is you're always told listen down to the bass, and in theory, there's something called figured bass where you have the bass line and then you write the melody based on the bass and then you fill in the rest. And I've really noticed this when auditioning for bands and they give me recorded rhythm guitars and lead guitars and they're like, write a melody. And I'm like, where's the bass? I don't know. I have no direction for a melody because the bass isn't there. He is absolutely right. True. However, on the flip side, 
bass player or mini fridge? Hmm. Oh shit! Which one the would you rather have? The mini fridge will keep the beer cold. So. <laughs> the mini fridge yeah. is always your friend. The mini fridge doesn't get drunk and throw his bass across the room, and the mini fridge keeps <laughs> your food cold. <laughs> The mini fridge may not play your instruments, but he will always be your friend, and he will always be there for you, unless the power goes out infinite, in which case you're screwed. These have been words of wisdom from Elements of Harmony. And this is Pegasus Device by Slipstorm. Yay. Even the pages of history lies a shadow hiding in a mystery. I lay in that story buried far away until it once again sees the light of day. When the little bits of Billy turn on all the lights and tell the story of a factory as black as night. The luxury of rainbows comes at a price, so just ignore the screams and don't think twice. You prove it to yourself and to all of us that you're not fit to fly like a Pegasus. You don't even deserve those wings you bear when you stand beside a legend you don't even compare. All of the failures of the fuel success and the bloody and visceral when the game of chess And just because you're disappointed you'll pay the price Now accept your fate and die in the Pegasus device To the ruined facility A horrible silence built an eerie tranquility The souls of many innocent fill the air And the hope that they all die were scattered here and there A mighty machine built within the wake Of a long dead dream, little demon awake The citizens sleep, never quite knowing when The device will reawaken, hungry again You prove it to yourself and to all of us That you're not fit to fly like a Pegasus You don't even deserve those wings you bear When you stand beside a legend you don't even compare All of the failures of the fuel success And the bloody and visceral when the game of chess And just because you're disappointed you'll pay the price Now accept your fate and die in the Pegasus device Success in the bloody and visceral where the game of chess And just because you've disappointed you'll pay the price Now accept your fate and die in the Pegasus device
So anyway, yeah, um, Glaze, great, great musician. So um, Pegasus Device. So what was your inspiration for that? Well, one of the one of the first songs. Well, the first song that I heard from the fandom was obviously Odyssey's Call of Sea Ponies. But um, one one of my most vivid memories, I think, from the whole musician side of the, of the fan base was uh, a friend sent somebody else who I was in the same chat with uh, a link to Rainbow Factory. And of course I clicked on it because I click on anything and I should not do that. And uh, I didn't really have any idea what was going on because I hadn't watched the show and I didn't know a whole lot about it. But I was like, this is really good and this is really weird. What's going on? So like the educated person that I am, I went and checked the description and the first thing I saw was link to a fan fiction. So I was like, you know what? Okay, why not? I have nothing to lose. I'm going to go read this and try and figure out what's going on. So, so after three hours of reading that and thoroughly regretting everything about reading descriptions ever, I was like, okay, this can't possibly be how things actually are because this is a kid's show. And so that was one of the things that actually drove me to watch the first um, episode of that was uh, cleansing myself, I suppose, of, of the... Uh, uh. Anyways, so um, Rainbow Factory Sense has been one of my favorite fandom songs. and um, while I didn't think that the first Rainbow Factory by Aurora Dawn, like the actual fan fiction, it, it wasn't bad, but it could have been better because it, it, it focused more on the gore than on the story, like on the scare factor. There was a story there, mm -hmm. which was why I was able to finish it, but it, it was it was just going for, for horrific, you know, scare factor more than, than actual story. But I kept up with him, and I heard that he was working on a sequel, which was Pegasus Device. And when he finally came out with that, I gritted my teeth and put on a suit of armor and dove into that. And I actually really liked it, because he he didn't focus so much on the gore at that time. It was still there, obviously, because it's Rainbow Factory, and it's a gory, evil place full of evilness. Oh, yeah, of course. But he he, uh, he focused more on, on a really good story, and there was a really interesting story there. So I was like, you know what? This is really cool. And I had it in my head that, you know, I'm assuming that he was done with that story after that. And I knew that Glaze probably wasn't going to work on it because he, he wrote Rainbow Factory and then he wrote Awoken. And I, I was assuming they were both done with it. And I was like, you know what? This is started on a song and this should probably end on a song. And I just want to write a song for Pegasus Device. So I had the idea in my head for a couple of months. And then when Halloween came around, I finally just sat down and wrote it. And it came out a lot better than I thought it was going to. And it just it turned into a thing apparently, according to some people that I pretend to respect. So it, uh, it just, it, it, it had been in concept for a long time and then Halloween came around and it just kind of happened. So uh, that, that's kind of how that went. I noticed that Glaze is a big influence for you, um, especially considering you did a full medley of pretty much every single Glaze song that has ever been produced. That, that, was, that was fun. I'm totally not a fanboy or anything. Don't judge me! <laughs> <laughs> but I had to ask, a, well, including Ga Glaze, I guess, but also aside from Glaze, what were your um, musical influences, both from the fandom and um, from beyond? Ooh. Gl Glaze, I would say Glaze is one of my inspirations, mostly because everything he does is so damn weird. Like, he's, he's just, like, he writes things that nobody else would ever think to write, and therefore they're all solid gold. Because they're just really different, you know? And he, he writes them in a very interesting way, and he sounds like a robot. And he's just kind of a lovable songwriter all around. Um, I guess people outside the fandom... Um, I'm a big fan of Owl City, apparently like everyone else on the planet is. Which is totally fine, because Owl City... <laughs> Six, do you have something to tell us? Are you hiding, no, Are you hiding something? No, no. You're saying you I don't like Owl City? I don't like Owl City. I have very particular, yeah, I have very particular uh, vocal. Yes. Um, yes. Yeah. Yes. No, his mm. his voice gets on yes. my nerves. It's not that it's like yes. bad music or anything I, like that. And I respect yes. I respect any musician who is willing to go up on the stage and perform live in front of people like that. It takes balls. But his voice, it just rubs me yes. the wrong way. I'm sorry. You know, I actually have to agree with you because I only heard one song by them and never looked them up after Was that. Was it Fireflies? I don't. Yeah. Yes, Fireflies. I enjoyed that Fireflies one. Yeah. when it came out, and then everything else he ever did, I didn't like. Okay, okay. I, I feel I feel slightly outnumbered here, but first off, Forrest, put your pants back on. <sighs> Second off, 
I don't know. I just <laughs> maybe I'm in the minority here, but screw you. I like Owl City, and therefore no, I'm not. I'm not saying that they're bad. I'm just. I'm just saying his voice. Just I don't like it. It's great. That's, my that's me. It's me. Yes. It's he does. It's not him. It's me. He does have a very. He does have a very different voice as to a lot of things, and I like it. You guys don't like it. We'll agree to disagree. So, Sliff, we're glad that you came on our show so that we can insult your favorite music. <laughs> I feel my dreams being crushed before my very eyes. I'm sorry we agree on Elements everything Elements of else. Harmony. Hey, man. Hey, man. You and, do you. Don't let anybody tell while, you different. While we're getting all a little off track, we've been talking about music for a little while. Why not talk a little bit about your, your animation? You also do quite a bit of 3D animation, correct? When it doesn't crash, and when I realize that I'm sometimes semi decent at it and I should probably do more of it. Yeah. But until then it just kind of crashes and I get really frustrated with it and then I never touch it again. So I use um, blender, which is free, which is the main reason I use blender because I don't feel like shelling out three and a half thousand dollars for whatever the current industry standard for 3d is because I don't have three and a half extra thousand dollars to spend on 3d ponies and blender works just fine. So would you call yourself a big a fan of animation? Yes, as as a, it, I don't know where I'm going with that. Yes, I am. So wh- what, do you, what do you think about Disney shutting down their 2D animation studio? With all due respect to everyone everywhere, they're all bits. <laughs> and I hate them. Because you shut down 2D Disney, there's just that it's all wrong. All of it's wrong. You, you can't do that. I'm beyond frustrated with that so yeah forest you have a fluttery a track so we're right? gonna have a, a sensor yeah fluttery a. <laughs> yeah you, you may want to uh to bleep that to bleep that out but that was perfectly justified yeah i do not regret anything <laughs> yeah i i completely agree with you i do a lot of uh 2d flash animation have you done any 2d animation um i have tried and i have flopped beyond all floppy belief <laughs> and it was just a big mess of wobbly lines, and I don't know. I just, I never, I don't think that I'm very good at it. So I've, I've tried and failed like a hero, and that's about it. Was it ponies or non ponies? Um, I, I tried a little bit of, of pony stuff. You know, back when I, back when I was starting out 3D ponies, I was just like, you know what, I'm gonna try 2D again and see what happens. And it turned into a big floppy mess, and I was like, okay. Nope, still bad at it. Moving on. Not gonna lie, I find it funny you create ponies in a program called Blender, and you made a song about Pegasus Device. <laughs> <laughs> and there oh, it is! Hey. Whoa! A while back you did a, a, a film for um, a piece I released that was in honor of Kiki. Oh, yeah, that. Um, did you want to talk about that briefly, or you know what inspired you to actually use that track or anything like that? Yeah, actually, I, I remember you released that track, and I just sort of fell in love with it. Because it was... Y- you improv... What did you actually do for that? I, I'm interviewing now, screw you. What did you uh, What did you do for that track? Like, did you just make it up on the spot? Did you... Because I heard, I heard somewhere that you improvised that. Did you improvise that whole thing? Um, um, so yeah, in regards to To Catch a Falling Star, yeah, it was... Um, it was a time when I was feeling very melancholy, sort of sad, and... I basically, yeah, just improvised on the piano and tried to express my feelings that way, which I'm prone to do whenever I feel um, down, basically. Um, Whenever I feel sad, the best thing for me to do is to sit at the piano and actually play, and that kind of expresses my emotions in a way that words and talking to people can't. Mm. And I had written that piece, and it just kind of, worked out to be um, sort of a perfect piece for Kiki. So what I did was I took the, the improvisation I did, cleaned up a couple rough bits, and added um, a really sort of simple string section in behind, and then just called it done at that. Because it's, it's one of those things where you can't overcomplicate it. It just has to be focus on piano and just, you know, really simple string backing just to give it body. And that's it. And you just release it. Sweet interviewing's fun. I see why you guys do this. Okay. <laughs> Anyways, um, so when I heard, when I first heard that piece, I just like instantly fell in love with it because, to be perfectly honest, I'm terrible about keeping up with like news and things in the fan base. I kind of forget that EQD exists from day to day, <laughs> and so I kind of have to remind myself of that sometimes. It's like I'm very disorganized when it comes to things like that. 
I had never actually heard about Kiki until I uh, saw the thing about her passing. And I was like, you know what? I don't know what's going on, and I don't know what this whole thing is about, but Forest Rain wrote a really cool piece, and I have an image in my head, and I'm going to do it because I have nothing else that I'm doing right now, and I want to make something for the, for this thing. Not really to jump on a bandwagon or anything, just because this, this feels like something that deserves something from me. So I just sort of just listened to the piece about 50 times, and it never got old, and I started forming images in my head, and I decided to go with it, because I, st I started reading into like Facebook and Twitter and things like that, and uh, I saw the tweet from Tara Strong that says that she was there as Kiki passed, so I was like, there should be nobody else in this but uh, Twilight and Kiki, and it just it worked out really well. It, it came together a lot better than I thought it would, so yeah. I didn't really make it for attention. I just made it because I felt that it needed to be made, and it, it accomplished the goal that I wanted it to, and that was that. It's a good point to make is that in moments like that, when artists release things, it's not a cry for attention. It's not anything other than us trying to honor somebody in the only way we know how. Hmm. I agree. So that got dark really fast. Um, yeah. Or sad. sad. No, it's just no, too, um, it, got, it got pretty it's sad. Melancholy. 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 There, there we go. Thank good you. word. But did you hear that moment of silence after we said that, though? Yeah. That, that was yeah. really loud. That was, deep. that was a very loud yeah. silence. That, I was like, was this silence. is going to be a loud, awkward silence. And I'm like, yeah. That is speaking to what we were talking about earlier, where sometimes silence is more important than words. I think that's going to be staying in the episode. Yay, education. Yeah. Let's do it. There was a song of yours that I was listening to right before the interview that you said you wrote in about an hour or something like that. Uh, regrets. Um, that was actually because I was I. It had been a bad day, to to say the least. And mm -hmm. I, I won't go into that, but it was it was very much just a frustrating day, and everything was going wrong. And I just sort of sat down and started writing, and I didn't stop until it was done, or until I felt like I couldn't, I didn't want to work on it anymore, and. At that point, it was done. So it was just, it was sort of, um, it's just like Forrest's uh, piece. I was just feeling like crap, and I sat down and started writing, and when I got up, it was done. It's a very, like, powerfully, uh, emotionally moving piece. I don't honestly know how that happened. I just sort of sat down and wrote. I wasn't really thinking about it. I just wrote what I felt, and that's what happened. It's, it's a very simple answer and probably not very informative, but that's just that's just what happened. There's nothing complicated about it. So now you started writing the music early 2013. Um, I've talked with a lot of people within this fandom that are really musically inclined, and they have, they really have this feeling that since they weren't around in the beginning, it's pointless to start writing music now because only the musicians, which you know have inspired you, such as Wooden Toaster and so on are the ones that are known because there's just too much flood of music now for people to really pick through it. And yet you came in writing music and you ended up with the number one spot on EFN's top 100 for 2013. Were you at all intimidated by the existing music or did it just inspire you to just try to raise the bar and write better music? I wouldn't say that I was intimidated by it. I would say that I had a lot to live up to because, um, you know, there's a lot of good musicians in this fan base, like beyond a lot of good musicians. And uh, I was hoping that I would be able to stand up to some of them, not like in a, in a competitive way, just, you know, I suppose measure up to the sort of legacy that this fan base has built around its musicians. I guess I, I could be kind of intimidated, like the fact that you might be overshadowed. But when it comes down to it, it's not so much about you know, making music for competitive when you're doing something like for free, for for fun, based on a fan thing, you shouldn't do it competitively. You should just do it to do it for fun. And you know, if you if you like making music, viewership shouldn't really matter. And you know, I mean, there's musicians out there with a bajillion more subscribers than me, and there's musicians out there with a bajillion less subscribers than me, and all of them are really good. And so it's not so much about subscribers to me; it's just about making things. I make things for fun and you should make things for fun too. And if you don't, then you're probably doing it wrong. So 
You're listening to Elements of Harmony on Everfree Network, and this is Slipstorm's adaptation of Octavia's Overture. Too long ago to a little town so calm and slow The days and months and years just kinda slipped on by You learned to play those ancient strings While the world listened to other things Until you finally just sat down to cry So you packed your bag and sat so long And you didn't look back to you were long gone Headed to the city to play your song Cause that's where you belong Your parents worry about you every day All your friends said you chose wrong But the promises of fame, success, and fortune Were just too strong Your only friend in the cold, cruel city Are your strings and bow Keep walking through the rainy streets With your head down low As the air gets colder And the rain turns to snow Whisper to yourself
we're going to talk a little bit about cover songs. Um, just to <laughs> just to get started with the discussion about cover songs, um, we we talked a little bit earlier in the interview about what kind of things draw you to songs, and for me, it's always been um, songs that I feel kind of lacked in some way or another or that could be enhanced by a different version so um like mm -hmm. i did i did autumn from jackalap because i thought it might be interesting in a different genre oh, um, i remember that whereas i covered memory lane because memory lane was just sort of this really simple piano track with vocals and tapping on a guitar and while it had a certain kind of awesome bohemian charm um, I thought that a, a, a more produced version could be more interesting, I guess. Um, and it just, it made me really excited to want to try to, you know, fully produce something like that. Um, so I don't know if that's, that's different for you or for Six or anybody else that does, you know, covers or anything like that. But. Forrest, you brought this upon yourself, but would you say that this is real life? Or is, <sighs> is this, this just, just fantasy? fantasy? <laughs> this is terrible. You're terrible. We're caught in a lot. We're caught in a no landslide. No escape from reality. reality. No escape from reality. Oh, this is terrible. You're fired. Just open your eyes. <laughs> you said Bohemian. <laughs> Look up to the, the sky and see, the see, dude. <laughs> I'm just a poor I'm boy. I'm just a poor boy. I need no sympathy. <laughs> because it's easy come, easy go. Little high, little low. And when the wind blows, doesn't really matter. Oh my god. This is so Everyone's like in a different key. I can't me. do this. Everybody's oh, as drunk no. as Starlight. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> oh god. That went a lot better than I would have uh, <laughs> I would have imagined. What was the question? <laughs> That's an excellent point. I'm glad you asked. <laughs> <laughs> the question. So, was so there sorry. wasn't a question. I was talking about what inspires us to actually work on a song and how that like... counts as a question. Okay. 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 So for me, for cover songs, it's more or less. You brought. You put it very well. You said that you know there's a way to expand on it, or that something was done. I don't want to say inadequately because that sounds kind of rude, but basically inadequately. You know. For me, it's it could be that it could be that I really like the song and I want to cover it because I'm a fanboy, or you know I want to cover it because I think it would be interesting in a different genre. It's basically just you know if you want to reimagine something because, like for for stories that are told by by word of mouth, like like older stories, they change from person to person. Every person tells a story in a different way, and sometimes somebody can tell a story in a really cool way. And then time somebody can tell a story and it just falls really flat. So it's it's all about how you tell the story. You know, you could tell it in a different way than the original person told it. As as it goes through more and more renditions, it becomes something else. And you know, covers are basically just retellings of a story. So, hmm, that's interesting. Sorry, I'm gonna jump in on this one. Um, primarily because I do a lot of reading and literature analysis stuff don't lie it, it's no really it's one of my hobbies because i've grown up like ever since i was little i've grown up um with a a group of friends who are they're far older than me they're like the same age as my dad um but they discuss philosophy so i've grown up studying text for basically my entire life and it's interesting that you say that sliff because uh, one of the things that pops up quite a bit especially when you're looking at older text and older literature especially stories is you know a retelling of a story especially when you do a cover or a remix it's interesting from the standpoint of the it's you're putting your own twist on it which makes it entirely different it's like you know homer's epic the odyssey you know it's it started out as a, at least according to current hypothesis it started out as a series of smaller stories that got sewn together into this one large thing that we have now as an epic. Hmm. Okay, so I'll jump into the uh, point about covers and stuff like that. So I don't really, I don't really do covers like you guys do them. I do them more like straightforward. You're just pretty much playing the song how they wrote it. Covers, mm -hmm. meaning guitar and stuff like that. I did, uh, or me and my sister uh, recorded. What is it called? Uh, Monsters and Men. 
Little Talks. That's the one. Yeah. Where I was playing guitar and then we were both just singing. And like from my point of view, I usually choose songs to cover just because they're fun. Like if I like playing it, then it's awesome. And then six hours later, when we finally get all the recordings done, I never want to hear it again until the next day. But That does tend to happen. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, they can be a little bit tedious sometimes, especially when you're trying to get it right. Oh, yeah. Hmm. And even then, like, I I suck. I feel like I suck anyway. Oh, don't be so hard on yourself. Oh, it's musicians. One of the things I have to ask Six specifically, because you're, you're not fully producing um, a cover version, so how do you... How do you start a cover? Like, do you just, you're just playing the song tabs. over and over and you're just trying it? <laughs> or, or tabs? Okay. No, I, I will literally, if, well, hold on. So from a guitar player standpoint, um, I'll usually see if it's got a guitar part in it. If it does, then I'm like, oh, cool. And this sounds like a cool guitar part. It's something I want to learn. It's something I want to use to further my uh, growth in guitar playing. So... That's pretty much it. I'll just learn it and then get it down to the point where I can play along with the recording. Like I've got a pretty awesome PA system right next to my head, and uh, that gets a lot of uh, use. Hmm. Okay. Um, and Sliff, specifically for you, how would you, how would you start a cover? Um, I would say that the 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 first thing I do is I just I listen to it over and over and over again. And I try to find the underlying, if you will, bass uh, melody. I just sort of find what keys it's in, mm-hmm. you know, what what little melody bits there are in it. And then um, if I'm like rewriting lyrics or something, I think about how I'm going to rewrite the lyrics. And I, I sort of just, I piece things together very messily. I, I sort of just add things here and there until it's done. But yeah, I just, I start out, I start out by figuring what key it's in, you know, what key I'm going to write in. And I just start putting bits of it in there. Until it until it starts to to shape up into an actual song, mm-hmm. and this is one of that the actually, things oh. that. Sorry, did you want to jump yes. in on a point there? I did. I wanted to uh, actually ask Sliff what he uses to write, or like if he just uses MIDI tracking, like just clicking buttons and stuff like that, or if he actually writes his melodies and chord progressions on piano or something like that. Uh, it depends on what I'm doing. Typically, I'll I'll use MIDI tracks. Um, but if it's like a, a, a really a piano piece that has a lot of piano in it, I'll record the piano myself. Or if it's like a guitar piece, you know, I, I record what I can physically, like on the actual instrument. But I don't have a whole lot of equipment for that. So yeah, I just mm-hmm. I just write MIDI tracks most of the time. How do you do the MIDI tracks? Um, do you do them through a MIDI keyboard, or do you just write the notes directly in? Um, I just write the notes directly in because as a piano player, I'm very clumsy. Uh, I, I did do a lot of piano, but I was never the best at it. So um, I typically I'll like I'll think about things on a piano. Like I'll I'll just mess around on a piano with keys and melodies until I get something that I sound you know that sounds cool to me. Mm-hmm. But then I'll go and actually write it in on a MIDI track so that I can fine tune it. That's interesting because that's that's one of the things that sort of struck me about Tombstone was that for the longest time, the Living Tombstone didn't have a MIDI keyboard at all. He actually wrote in all his, um, all his tracks were just written directly and with a mouse on a MIDI track. Um, mm-hmm. I, don't, I, don't have a, I don't have a MIDI keyboard either. Wow. And, and that's the thing, just to, just, just to expand on for the people that don't know that are out there. Um, MIDI is basically just a format that uh, computers use to understand instruments. Um, so if you have a MIDI keyboard, nowadays it mostly plugs in through USB, but it used to plug in through what's called a MIDI port. Um, and basically it just takes data that you enter in, and it's it's basically just data over time, and it just kind of records it so that it can reproduce that performance. Um, it's not actually any kind of audio or anything like that, it's literally just data that says you press this note on the keyboard this hard at this point in time. Which is why you can set MIDI keyboards to play different instruments. You're not actually playing an instrument, you're just putting, pressing buttons. That's right, yeah. Um, and it's fantastic because you can record a MIDI performance and then you can go in and you can tweak individual notes. You can adjust when you hit them, how loud they are, all that kind of stuff. So MIDI is insanely valuable um, for recording. And um, a lot of us, when you know we've been recording for a while, we forget this stuff that people don't realize. Oh, you can record in MIDI and just have like a sampled keyboard play it back. 
Whereas, you know, a lot of people think, oh, well, you just, you record a piano and that's it. You have a piano recorded on an audio track somewhere. That actually brings up another point. Um, do you guys uh, use anything specific for your instruments that you use in MIDI tracking and stuff like that? Like I have uh, native instruments mm -hmm. for my sonar stuff. I haven't really cracked it open to try to use it yet, but yeah. So what do you guys use? Um, I can go first if you want. Um, for all of my recording, I use Pro Tools 8 um, with some built-in plugins that are included in Pro Tools 8, including uh, Mini Grand, which I use for most of my piano sounds. Um, and I use Contact 3, which is from Native Instruments, um, as all my sampled orchestral instruments, band instruments, all my basses, all my drums. Uh, some of my, uh, my uh, pianos come from that. All of the organs, everything, pretty much every one of my sounds is from Contact 3, um, except for the Mini Grand and except for guitars. Um, guitars I record live. That's the only way to do it. Um, I, yeah, I agree. Um, I use FL Studio 10 uh, with just the, the built-in Edison plugin, which is for recording, because everything that I use equipment-wise uh, works into FL Studio pretty well. Uh, for all of my orchestral, I use Eddie Roll Orchestral. And then... Uh, Native Instruments, Massive for synths and electronic and stuff. And uh, for samples, I honestly just go out and find something that works and just bring it in there and see if I can do anything with it. I just wanted to thank our guest tonight, Slipstorm. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me, gentlemen. Also, stay tuned to Everfree Network this weekend for Eastern Sounds, Saturday at 1 Central Time, Mixology Saturday at 6 Central Time, and Saturday Night Songs with Michelle Krieber, Saturday night at 9 p.m. Central Time. Also, Sunday, tune in to Blue Screen Bronies at 7 p.m. and Pegasus Circle Live at 9. Until next week, this is Horace Train, Starlight Iron Huff, Zeta Prime, and Six String signing off. And I said to her, now listen here, it's cold and dark outside. I don't know why you're here. I don't know where you're from, I know your name. But never fear, cause you've got a voice that can make an angel cry. And if the sky seems dark and gray, don't you let your spirit die. Just sing the baby. How's it going? This is Six String. Starlight Iron Hoof. Four Strain. And Zeta Prime. And this is Elements of Harmony. Tonight on the show, we interview one of the biggest up-and-coming artists in the fandom, having landed four tracks on the Everfree Radio Top 100 for 2013, including the number one spot, you could say that this artist is taking the airwaves by storm. Not just a musician, but a 3D animator as well, the multi-talented Slipstorm joins us here tonight. Okay, so this week we are introducing... Um, an amazing breakout artist from the Brony fandom, somebody who has risen from just joining YouTube and has risen to 3,000 subscribers in only one year and has landed three tracks on the Everfree Top 100 of 2013 this year. Um, we are very honored and humbled to introduce this breakout artist, Slipstorm. Hi, that's me. How are you doing today? I'm doing fantastic. How are you? Good. Welcome to the show. Thank you. It is lovely to be here. So, right off the cuff, I'll just ask, who are you and where did you come from? I love the phrasing of that question. Not gonna lie, that was that was phrased very well. Um, my name is Travis. I'm Sliff or Sliff Storm. Uh, I honestly just I'm one of those people who just kind of makes stuff. I have really no real direction for experiences. <laughs> yeah, but anyways, um. <laughs> 
So yeah, it was, I was honestly calling the seed ponies. I had no idea what was going on, but I was like, this is really good. And so I, I started like interrogating my friends about this, like what the heck's going on. So they explained the whole musicians thing. I was like, okay. So after that, I went on about a seven hour binge of listening to fandom music. And I was like, okay, I, I got to figure out what's going on here. So I sat down and I watched the first episode on YouTube. 16 hours passed and I got done with the first season and I realized that it was morning and I had stuff to do. And I had no regrets about that whatsoever. Um, as for getting into mu- as, uh, music, I had never actually recorded music or like composed music before this, but I, uh, I accidentally stumbled onto the Toastbeard competitions, which uh, I know a lot of famous musicians have done. Mm-hmm. And I just decided to try my hand at it. So I, I made some terrible little thing for the first one, and I thought that it was really fun. So I, I just kept at it and eventually got better. and it just expanded into what it is now, which is still a big mess like it was at the beginning, but it's a slightly more professionally done mess than it was before. So so how long would you say you have been doing your music? It's almost a full year now, I think. Yeah, yeah, about a full year, maybe two weeks off. Now, you said you hadn't actually um, uh, composed music before that point. What was going through your mind that actually said, hey, I can sit down and do this? Uh, because I realized that most of the people in the fan base who were recording music were like, w- they were amateurs. Like, not we don't have too many actual professional musicians in the fan base. Like, I know we have quite a few, but overall, most of them are just you know amateurs who are making music for the fun of making music, and a lot of people make music for free, and they just do it for fun. I was like, this could be this could be really fun, and I've always wanted to try it. So why the heck not? What you know, what's the worst that could go wrong? So I, I just I. Went and got a demo FL Studio, and I sat down and tried it, and it was really fun, so I kept at it. One of the things that you mentioned, too, was professional musicians in the fandom, and I feel that we should at least take... That stuff's always free, but it's I always put a Bandcamp link, and people pay me, and it's it's incredible. I never expected that to actually happen, so it's it's been a really interesting experience. Uh, I want to jump back a few steps. Um, you said that you hadn't recorded prior to the uh, fandom and stuff like that, or prior to, like, just a little while ago. Yep. Uh, do you have any uh, traditional musical background, like uh, maybe high school band or orchestra or something like that? Um, I did band in middle school, both both middle school and high school. Um, I was uh, percussion and drum major, respectively. So I've I've played music for a long time. I just haven't recorded or you know composed or produced anything. Um, I've played piano for like a billion years. I honestly can't remember. It's some like. 15 years or something ridiculous like that so um i would say i've been doing music a long time i just haven't been making music a long time if that makes sense drum majors are cool i had a bunch of friends who were drum majors yeah drum major was frustrating because uh i went to a very new high school uh we were the first graduating class so the first year of band we only had two percussionists so we had to like play stuff with our feet it was awesome (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and and as we kept going i realized that my uh our, our conductor was an idiot unfortunately and it was he wasn't like one of those idiots who's just a blatant idiot like he really tried really hard he was just really stupid and i tried not to hate him for it but i just uh everything he did annoyed me so are you ready to go on air to the public saying those statements <laughs> is your drum conductor going to be listening uh if he is, then he will probably not take any offense to it because he's an idiot. But um, <laughs> yeah, I, all right then, I, you heard it here, folks. <laughs> I don't know. It's like he's he's one of those people who thinks that the way he thinks is the absolutely correct way to think, and if you think anything else, then you're wrong. And he would actually tell people that, like you, you know, you need to think again until you're thinking in the right way. And I wanted to just go slap him in his stupid face, but I get in trouble if I do that. A moment to kind of expand on that in a way. For you, what would you say that a, that a professional musician would be like? Somebody that actually, before the fandom, was making money off of music or you know performing. Um. Hmm. Now that you mention it, it's a really fine. It's it's a really blurry line. Actually, uh, I would say like. Um, I know, I know the Living Tombstone professionally produces because he was uh, he was producing music before that, and he's done music for things like um, Tom's Cause AF, ASDF series. Um, Odyssey was doing music professionally, but like I said, it's it's hard to tell. So I don't want to call anyone out saying that anybody's professional or unprofessional. 
Right. But it's like a lot a lot of people do this just for fun and they don't make a living off of it. Mm-hmm. You know, they just they just make music because it's a good stress reliever or because it's something they enjoy. So if if I had to restate restay that, uh, I would say that uh, you know a lot of people just do it for fun and not to make a living. Yeah, well, one of the interesting things about it too is that through the pony fandom, a lot of artists have been able to actually go from taking something that's for fun and just sort of sort of start to move into actually making some money off of it, either through donations or through you know stuff like Bandcamp and stuff like that, mm. um, which has been great. Like it, it was the same thing for me. Um, I didn't make any money off of my music until the fandom, and I mean, I still provide everything that I make for free. And I also provide it on Bandcamp if people want to buy it. And there's a lot of people out there that will actually just buy your stuff because they want to support you as an artist. Yeah, I've, I've had that happen, actually, because um, I used to put all my stuff up on, like, SoundCloud and Dropbox and stuff because I was like, yeah, there's no way anybody's going to buy this. this is bleh. And then uh, I had a couple of people say, hey, where can I buy your music? And I'm like, what? You want to pay <laughs> me for this crap? So I was like, okay, I'll... <laughs> I'll put it on Bandcamp and see what happens. And people started paying me for it, and it was it was crazy. So, like like you, I, I always offer my stuff for free because I don't know. I almost feel kind of bad charging for it because it's like I don't know. I always love when music's offered for free, especially if it's if it's good music. And a lot of people in the fan base do offer really really good music for free. So, my how I go about it or how I do it, which often causes a lot of my projects to go downhill, unfortunately. But um. I just make music because it's fun, and I make animation because it's fun, and I'm an artist because it it's a good stress reliever, and I just enjoy doing it. Cool. Your name is Slifstorm. Where does Slifstorm come from? Um, Slif is actually um a variation of the word sylph, which is like a, some sort of like mythological um like air elemental from some point in history. I don't know where it is. It's some cool mythological thing, and therefore no other questions should be asked. But I didn't know that it was spelled Sylph, and so for many years I spelled it Sliff, and by the time I figured out my error, I was too lazy to fix it, so I just sort of went with it, and then I just added Storm on the end because it sounds cool. Fair enough, fair enough. So what got you into doing pony music? And um, I noticed that your, your YouTube was created at the beginning of 2013, correct? Mm-hmm, yeah. What brought you into the fandom? What, what sort of uh, got you started with ponies and, and doing music? I got into the whole pony thing because I had I, I was one of those people who knew about the whole pony thing, but I was just kind of indifferent on the matter. Like I don't really want to be a part of this, but it doesn't really bug me because I had a lot of friends who were bronies and they would exchange pony things and Skype and whatnot, and they would all go over my head, and I would just kind of ignore them. But over time, I started learning stuff about the whole pony thing without actually being um, a brony. And uh, at one point, I remember a friend of mine was sending somebody else fandom musicians songs, and I think it was uh, it was one of Odyssey's actually. I remember it being um, Call of the Sea Ponies. It was Odyssey's remix of Call of the Sea Ponies, and I just clicked on it because I'm one of those people who clicks on everything in a Skype chat, uh, regardless of what it is. And that's made for some actually very bad experiences. I should probably stop doing that. Um, <laughs> But Rule yeah, 34 and stuff like that? Uh, yes, more stuff yeah, we yeah. shouldn't talk about on Everfree? I don't want to talk about it anymore. It was 